television producers and publishers have discovered that sorcery sells. And they're capitalizing on this. And they are producing a vast array of movies and shows and books that all make witchcraft seem to be fun for kids. And I think the parents are naive when they see no connection between the popularity of Harry Potter and the popularity of real witchcraft. Revelation 18, 23 says, through sorcery, all nations were deceived. Welcome back to part two of a five-part series called Hour of the Witch. The controversial title of this program is right there on the screen, and it's called the Harry Potter Wicca Connection. I'm sure you are aware of the fact that the Harry Potter books are the most popular books that have ever been written for kids throughout the history of the world. The author, J.K. Rowling, it says there in Time Magazine, June 23, 2003, page six, it says that she has mesmerized an entire generation of kids. She is now richer than the Queen of England, if you can believe that. Uh, she used to be on welfare, and now she could buy a whole, a whole fleet of planes. She is so wealthy. There are seven books planned in the Harry Potter series. The most recent one is called Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Over 250 million copies of these books have been sold. Warner Brothers has committed to producing seven full-length feature high-budget movies based upon every book. The influence of Potter mania today is, is truly staggering uh, around the world and also in the United States. What is Harry Potter about anyway? It is a tale of witches and wizards and sorcerers. And let me just give you a little background in, in case you're not aware just to tell you basically what the storyline is. It's about a boy named Harry, uh, a boy whose parents, James and Lily Potter, were good witches. In the series, they are considered to be good witches, but they are brutally murdered by another evil wizard, and his name is Lord Voldemort. Uh, Voldemort killed Harry's parents and tried to kill baby Harry, but as he cast a curse upon him, the curse, for some reason, bounced back. It left a scar on Harry's forehead. It bounced back on the evil wizard, stripped him of his powers, powers, and he vanished into, into the night. Another good wizard named Albus Dumbledore, who was the headmaster of a school for witches called Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, he takes the little baby Harry, and he takes him and puts him in a basket and puts him on the doorstep of his non-magical relatives who are called the Dursley family. The Dursleys are called muggles, and this word muggle applies in the Potter series to all the people of the world who are not, not magical. And this is very important to understand that the Harry Potter series divides the worlds into the, the witches and the wizards and the muggles. The witches and the wizards are those that have the power of witchcraft, and the muggles are everybody else. When Harry is 11 years old, he is visited by a messenger from Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. And this man's name is Hagrid, and he comes to Harry at, his, at the house of the Dursley family, these non-magical, boring, party-pooping people, and he comes to Harry and he tells him that he is really a wizard. At that point, Harry didn't know it. Uh, this information was kept from him by the Dursley family. And Hagrid tells Harry that he's now 11, and it's time for him to pack his bags and to get ready to go to school, to learn how to be, to learn how to be a very powerful wizard or a witch. And so Harry packs his bag, he buys a wand, he purchases a cauldron, he gathers a whole batch of sorcery books together, and he goes to school to develop his, his wizard skills, his sorcery powers. Each one of the Harry Potter books, and again, there's seven of them, basically each book takes you through another school year at Hogwarts. And in between the school years, Harry goes back home to live with the Dursleys, uh, his, his relatives, who again are, are muggles, they're boring people, they're, they're considered to be rather cruel. If you read the, the books, the storyline, uh, they're they're definitely portrayed in a very uh, rather stupid light, and Harry spends a boring summer with the Dursleys, and then he goes back to school, which is where all the excitement goes on at Hogwarts. Each book also contains a rather scary encounter between Harry Potter as he's developing his sorcery abilities and 
the evil wizard who tried to kill his parents, who was determined to kill him, to regain his powers, and to gain control of the entire wizard world. And so that's it in a nutshell. That's what Harry Potter is about. It's a battle between the good wizards and the bad wizards, the, the good guys and the bad guys. The good wizards are Harry Potter, Albus Dumbledore, uh, Hermione, and Ron. These are friends of Harry's, student friends, and then Voldemort and his gang. The, the good wizards practice white magic, and the evil wizards practice uh, black magic. This series has become so popular that it's, uh, like I said, it's gone to the top of the charts, and there's probably no book, no series of books that have ever been written that have captured the attention of young people more than Harry Potter. Most parents and readers, and this also applies to the media, consider the Potter series to be just plain, good old, harmless fun and entertainment. Now, they don't really see anything to be concerned about when they think about Harry Potter. Most parents who have kids that are reading the Potter books, their major uh, joy is that kids are reading. Johnny's reading a book. They're actually turning off TV sets and they're, they're reading 700, 800, 900 page books. Sometimes they've never really gotten into books before at all, and now they're reading these books and parents are absolutely thrilled. Uh, and other people say, well, hey, they're just fiction. It's just, it's all fantasy. It's all just a novel. It's nothing to be concerned about at all. And the pro-Potter people say that there's no connection to real witchcraft in Harry Potter at all. That is the argument on the pro-Potter side. Well, uh, there are a lot of parents that don't agree with this. And in fact, I don't know if you know this or not, but the Harry Potter books, and this was actually reported in Time Magazine, uh, I've got the issue, I don't have it right in front of me, but Time Magazine said that the Harry Potter books are the most opposed books in the history of the United States. They have been banished from uh, a lot of bookstores, a lot of libraries, because parents have risen up and said, we don't want our kids being exposed to these books. So there is really a raging controversy going on concerning Harry Potter, returning concerning those that are in favor of them and those that are against them. Uh, most of the people that are creating, creating cause for concern are Christians. But the amazing thing is that even within the Christian community, there is a battle going on between Christians that are in favor of the Potter books and those that are, that are against them. There's a whole series of books on both sides that are coming out from Christian authors. Here's one of them. This you can find on walmart.com. This is a book by John Granger called Looking for God in Harry Potter. And this book is, it says, a roadmap for using the Harry Potter books to teach children Christian truth. So this is a pro-Potter book written by a Christian. Here's another one called God, the Devil, and Harry Potter by a minister named John Killinger. And he says that the Potter stories actually influence young readers to follow the teachings of Jesus. And these are representative of a lot of different books. And then there are other books on the other side written by other Christians who say that the first two books written by the first two Christians, that these men are misled. And here's one of them written by uh, Richard of Baines. He wrote a book called Harry Potter and the Bible, The Menace Behind the Magic. And he says that Rowling's books, quote, desensitize children to the dangers of the occult. And here's another one by Stephen Dollinger, and he wrote a book called Under the Spell of Harry Potter. And on page seven of this book, Dollinger wrote, to be very blunt, this is witchcraft in the form of a child's book. So these are the, the sides. And there's, like I said, a raging controversy, and many parents are confused. Uh, is Harry bad or good? Is he a friend or, or is he a foe? Are these books that are so popular, are they just friendly, imaginary uh, fiction books? Or is there something inside them that Christians or anybody really should be concerned about? Uh, we're going to go deeper into this topic and we're going to explore whether there is a menace behind the magic, whether it's just fiction, or whether there is a lot of real things inside the books that parents should be concerned about. And the big issue in the light of witchcraft is this. Are the Harry Potter books fueling the craze for Wicca witchcraft among kids? We have witchcraft growing on the one side, we have the popularity of Harry Potter on the other side. Is there a connection at all uh, between the two tracks that we're seeing? I personally believe that there is. I believe that the Harry Potter books are definitely creating an interest, at the very least, at the very least, in checking out real witchcraft and the occult, which is very accessible right now, as we talked about on the internet and through books. And so we're gonna continue to explore this topic. I hope that you'll stick with me. It'll be very enlightening, so please don't go away.
Okay, welcome back. Thank you for uh, continuing to be with me as we continue studying the controversial topic of the Harry Potter Wicca connection. And that's what I want to address right now is, is there a connection? A lot of parents don't think so. Others are convinced that there is. Are the Harry Potter books fueling interest in real witchcraft among teenagers today? That is, that is the question. Uh, as we are about to see, there are some definite surprising connections between real witchcraft and the Harry Potter books that many parents do not see, but they are definitely there, and there is a lot of the real thing inside of these books. So let's just find out. Uh, first of all, the whole idea of good witches fighting bad witches, evil witches fighting uh, good witches, the whole idea of white magic versus black magic. This is definitely a very basic theme to the Harry Potter books. It is also a basic theme to the TV shows and movies that are out right now, the Sabrina series, the Charm series, the Buffy series. Some of them aren't airing right now, but they've been airing, and they have the same theme of the good witches versus, versus the bad witches, white magic versus black magic. Here is a picture here of the book Teen Witch. I showed you this a little bit ago. On the back cover, on the inside cover, it talks about how this book is all about the art and the science of white magic, a gentle, loving practice. So here's real witchcraft talking about white magic, and that's what the Harry Potter series talks about. Here's another couple of covers. I showed you this some time ago. These are two books you can find on walmart.com, helping yourself with white witchcraft and the magic power of white witchcraft revised for the millennium. So here's the connection. The Harry Potter series is all about good witches versus bad witches, white magic versus black magic, and that is the same basic philosophy that you find in real witchcraft books that are all around today. So that is connection number one. Another connection is the idea of uh, good witches protecting themselves against evil through the use of spells. This is also basic to the Harry Potter, the Harry Potter series. Here's a picture of one of the Harry Potter books. This is the first one, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And on page 134, it says that the class that everyone was looking forward to was Defense Against the Dark Arts. When Harry, this fictitious boy, goes to this school, Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, he takes a lot of classes. He takes classes on potions, divinations, and spells, and then he takes his defense classes where he learns how to, how to cast good spells against evil forces to protect himself and to protect his friends. Well, that very uh, philosophy of protecting yourself through the use of spells, that is also very strongly a Wicca witchcraft philosophy. Here again is this book, Teen Witch, on page 201. There's a whole section here, a whole chapter that deals with protective spells. Page 201, and it talks about protection magic, how we can protect ourselves and our homes, our families, and our friends. And this is written for teenagers. It says, you have three very important assets to protect yourself. Number one is common sense. Number two is our American system of justice. And number three is witchcraft. And so the Harry Potter books, here you've got Harry Potter with his defense against the dark arts, learning how to use spells to protect himself. And that's exactly what Teen Witch, which is a book for real kids into real witchcraft, they're both saying the same thing. The basic concept is the same. It's the same. So there, again, is a very clear Harry Potter Wicca connection. That's two. Now, the third one is when you look at the Harry Potter books closely, and I've done this for research purposes, when you look, this is one of the books. When you look at them carefully, and uh, if you choose to, to analyze them and read them, you discover that the Harry Potter books are filled with references to real things, real places like London and Africa and Egypt and Australia, real people. Uh, one of the books, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, page 66, mentions a man named Aldebert Waffling, who was a real French mystic who lived in the, in the eighth century and who was condemned for sorcery. It also mentions real practices like fortune telling and the use of, of potions and astrology and divination and channeling spirits. This is also in the Harry Potter series. It mentions real tools like wands and cauldrons and crystal balls. Now, this is a very amazing reference, and I've got the book right here, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. It's a big book. It's almost 900 pages, and kids are devouring these books, literally devouring them, turning off the TV and reading. Here on page 487, it talks about 
one of Harry's friends was injured by Voldemort and they rushed to the hospital to see him. He was at a wizard hospital and they went to try to find which bed he was in. And on page 447, a witch looked at the chart and then directed Harry and his friends to go to the right room to visit the sick man. And, and the witch said, yes, he's in the first floor. He's in the second door on the right, Die Llewellyn Ward. Now that probably means nothing to you, Die Llewellyn Ward. But when I read that, I thought that is absolutely astonishing. Have you ever heard the name Llewellyn before? Well, guess what? Guess who the publisher is of Teen Witch? Take a guess. When you open up, it says right there, the publication is Llewellyn Publications. The publisher of Teen Witch is the same word that's used in the Potter book. This is also the publisher of another book here called The Truth About Witchcraft Today by Scott Cunningham. Llewellyn Publications is one of the biggest uh, and most popular publishers of real witchcraft books that are being sent to kids and, and adults around the world. And that's the very word that is used uh, in, the, in the Potter books. And I thought, why did Mrs. Rowling choose to use that word? Well, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but it definitely reveals her familiarity with the occult. And there's no question that there is a connection. Llewellyn also has a website called teenwitch.com where kids can go on and learn all about spells and potions and magic. Now let's take a look at our Bibles. Let's open our Bibles, if you have a Bible with you, and take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 18. I just want to look at one passage here about what the Bible says about these very words that we read all about in the Harry Potter books. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. This is Moses talking to the Israelites before they went into the promised land. He said, when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to do the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire or who practices witchcraft, I'm reading the New King James Version, or who is a soothsayer or one who interprets omens or a sorcerer or one who conjures spells or a medium or a spiritist or one who calls up the dead for all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. So here at this book, this chapter talks about spells, witchcraft, sorcery, and these are the exact things that are being uh, portrayed and modeled in Harry Potter. So here's all these kids around the country and they're reading books that have a lot of the real thing in it in spite of all the fantasy. And there's a lot of fantasy in Harry Potter, but there's a lot of the real thing, a lot of it. And it's woven in throughout the fantasy. It's a mixture of reality and fantasy. And as they're reading all about this, they're reading about a super cool kid who battles evil and who casts spells and who practices magic. Now the question is, when kids watch these things, is this going to have any influence drawing them toward wanting to check out the real thing? Well, here's an article that appeared in a British publication called This Is London, and the article was called Potter Fans Turning to Witchcraft, August 4, 2000. And this was from the Pagan Federation. They're a promoter of Wicca in England, and they said they have received a flood of inquiries following the success of the Harry Potter books. So you can see the connection, and here this article says that this pagan Wiccan organization has gotten a lot of responses from kids as a result of their reading Harry Potter. And so uh, unless a parent's head is in the sand, it's very obvious that kids who are reading this books, these books, not all of them, but a lot of them are checking out real witchcraft. It's happening right now. Is there an alternative to Harry Potter? Is there something better that our kids can be reading? Something good and wholesome and that leads them heavenward? Yes, there is, and I'll tell you about it as soon as we come back. Kids today love stories, and that's not bad. But the, the real issue is what, what messages are being communicated through the stories. Here's a verse I'd like to share with you in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. And this is what God says about the kind of things we should be thinking about. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue and if there is any praise, think about these things. God wants kids and all of us to be thinking about things that are pure, and that applies to the stories that we read. In verse 23 of the same chapter, the Bible says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. 
I, I have developed a principle, and especially as a, as a new dad, I want to follow this principle, and that is that when you, when you take something away from a child, you should put something in its place, something that is, something that is better and that is good. And I would like to recommend a book called Pilgrim's Progress. I don't know if you've heard of it or not. It's a classic. It came out of the uh, 1600s. It was published originally in 1678, written by John Bunyan. It's an allegory. It's easy to find in, in most bookstores. And it's a story about a, a young man, a Christian, or his name becomes Christian. That's his name. And he finds a scroll, and he begins his journey away from the city of destruction as he heads on the narrow way toward the celestial city. He meets friends like Evangelist and Hopeful and Faithful and Charity. He meets, meets good friends, and he also meets uh, foes like Worldly Wise Man and Talkative and Giant Despair. He learns lessons, lessons about the importance of turning away from sin, the importance of faith in God, the importance of obedience, the importance of purity and humility and trust. And I can promise you, none of these lessons are in the Harry Potter books. They have nothing to do with purity and faith in God and humility and obedience. Uh, and these lessons are in The Pilgrim's Progress. It's a fiction book. It's been around for, for over 300 years, and yet it has inspired young people for a long, long time. Through its interesting stories, it has inspired them to turn away from sin and to follow God and his son, Jesus Christ. The climax of the Pilgrim's Progress story, or at least the high point, is when Christian, who when he first left the city of destruction, he, developed, he develops a burden on his back. He starts reading the scroll, reading the Bible. He's got this burden that represents his sin. And at the climax of the Pilgrim's Progress, as he's journeying toward the celestial city, he, he approaches a hill, and he looks up on top of the hill, and he sees God's son hanging on a cross, outstretched, arms open wide, expressing his love for the whole human family. And as the, the pilgrim, Christian, looks up and sees the cross, he gazes in wonder at the sacrifice of God's son. And what happens? Lo and behold, the burden, the heavy burden that had been upon his back, it falls off. And it rolls all the way down the hill, down, 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 down. And he finds himself completely free from his burden through the grace and the goodness of Jesus Christ. And I can tell you, that lesson is not in Harry Potter. And that's a lesson that our kids need. That's the lesson that I learned 25 years ago when I first saw Jesus. And that's the lesson God wants you to learn and all of us to learn the incredible love of his son who died for you.